Uh, good morning, sir. Can you uh, see and hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Can I call Charles Scipione, please? Yes. You could repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Scipioni. Please do take a seat. Can you give us your room full name, please? Charles Anthony Scipioni. You've been instructed as an expert witness by this inquiry, and you've kindly prepared a written report as a result of those instructions. Is that right? Yes. Uh, please, can we see your report of the 14th of September 2022? Thank you very much. For the record, it's EXPG 601. You've got a hard copy in front of you um, in case you need it, but um, it should be displayed on the screen as well. Is that the first page of your report? Yes. And including appendices, is it 174 pages in length? Yes. And I think it's divided into two parts, parts one and two. And part one is between pages 12 and 64. If you could just turn that up and confirm, please. Yes. So that's part one, beginning on page 12. And then if we go forward to 64, we can see the end of part one. And then part two is between pages 65 and 160. Yes. When the appendices begin on uh, page 161, and I think there are five appendices, um, A, B, C1, C2, and C3. Yes. As you know, you're kindly giving evidence to us, Mr. Scipioni, in two stages, today and possibly tomorrow, about the matters addressed in part one of your report. And then on the 17th and 18th of November this year, you will return to give evidence about part two of your report. Do you understand that? Yes. Uh, can you confirm the following, please? Um, firstly, you've made clear in part A of your report which facts and matters referred to are within your own knowledge and which are not? Yes. Secondly, that those facts in part one of your report that are within your own knowledge, you confirm to be true? Yes. And thirdly, that the opinions you've expressed in part one of your report represent your true and complete professional opinions on the matters to which they refer? Yes. Thank you. Can I um, begin by asking you your qualifications and experience as an expert witness? I think you hold a Bachelor of Science degree from Texas A&M. Um, is that right? That is correct. The A&M standing, I think, for um, agricultural and mechanical. That is correct. And you hold um, a Master of Business um, Administration, Masters of Business Administration, an MBA from the same university. That is correct. I think your professional career began at um, Arthur Anderson, a firm headquartered in Chicago, and which at its height was one of the largest public accounting firms in the 1990s, with 85,000 um, employees operating across the world. Is that right? Yes. And is it right you worked in the information systems risk management business within the firm? Yes, that is correct. Uh, what did your work then involve? Uh, the, the work that we performed uh, while I was at Arthur Anderson uh, was around systems controls, uh, uh, a lot of general controls reviews, which simply means making sure that the uh, proper policies and procedures surrounding the financial systems at firms uh, were in place and uh, allowed for the auditors to rely upon the information that was uh, in, in those systems. I uh, also performed uh, a number of application control tests, which uh, was a little bit more in-depth on individual applications, uh, whether uh, they were efficacious or not, um, and, and various, uh, it really depended on, on which project I was working on, but it was generally to, to look at the efficacy of systems. You say in your report you developed and implemented 
database applications and analyses relating to litigation and bankruptcy clients. That is correct. In, in addition to the audit uh, uh, projects that I just mentioned, I also developed, uh, also worked a lot with our litigation and our bankruptcy group uh, in developing, maintaining, uh, developing, deploying, and maintaining database applications related to either uh, companies that we had been hired to help through the bankruptcy process in the United States or uh, companies that hired us to perform expert work uh, in litigation, in the litigation arena. I think um, in due course you left Arthur Anderson and set up your own consulting firm, uh, Scipione and Associates. That is correct. And when was that? Uh, that would have been around uh, 1994. And what did that venture involve? Uh, uh, that was, basically I was a uh, software developer. Um, I was, uh, uh, for various clients, I would uh, design, uh, develop, uh, deploy, and maintain uh, software applications. You mentioned in your report for the note, it's 2.1.4, that the software that you designed, developed, and maintained was DOS. What um, is or was DOS? Uh, DOS, uh, is, it stands for Disk Operating System. It, it's basically the operating system for uh, PC-based computers uh, uh, that was developed by Microsoft. And it runs from a disk drive, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. And th this was a Microsoft um, product, um, the predecessor to Microsoft Windows, is that right? Th that's correct. I think in um, 2001 you joined um, Alex Partners, is that right? That is correct. And can you explain, please, um, who or what um, Alex Partners is? Uh, Alex Partners is a global consultancy um, that uh, performs a, a variety of services for clients. Uh, uh, probably at that point in time was best known for their turnaround and restructuring services within the United States. Uh, uh, they um, uh, basically would take over companies that um, uh, filed for Chapter 11 protection within the United States and operate those companies uh, through uh, the, the bankruptcy process, which often terminated in a plan of confirmation uh, to get those companies out of bankruptcy. Thank you. You say that when you joined, you helped establish the claims management service. What did that involve? Yes, yeah, so uh, a big part of the bankruptcy process in the United States has to do with the reporting um, of all of the assets and liabilities of the debtor company that's going into bankruptcy uh, for purposes of allowing uh, the creditors to understand the debtor's position on, on amounts that they think that they owe the creditors. Uh, there are a number of, there are several reports that are required by the court um, Alex Partners did not have uh, a system to do that, and the group that I belong to, uh, as we were acquired by Alex Partners, uh, took over all of the administrative responsibilities for reporting in the court. Thank you. You say that this involved interrogating, collecting, and organizing vast amounts of disparate financial and operational data from your client's systems. Is that right? That is correct. And um, uh, for what kind of clients? Uh, for what kind of clients was that service established and operated? Uh, so, so that's the, uh, the bankruptcy process that I was just referring to. Um, uh, some example clients uh, uh, that we worked on were uh, WorldCom, General Motors, Kmart. Um, uh, uh, it, uh, there are a vast number of them, uh, but, but all very large, very major bankruptcies uh, uh, from the 2001 to, to current time frame. Uh, were you the architect of those systems? Yes. And are they still in use today? They are. I think you're presently a managing director within the risk analytics group at um, Alix Partners, is that right? That is correct. And you've held that position for over 15 years? Yes. And is it right you've been retained in that position by clients to provide factual and expert evidence in relation to the efficacy of application systems and the management and analysis of data sets relating to litigation and regulatory issues? Yes. And I think although it's right that you've um, plainly given expert evidence before, it's fair to say that you are primarily a practitioner rather than somebody who spends most of their time in the courts. Is that right? That is correct. Overall, therefore, you have um, 
uh, some 30 years' experience in information technology. Is that right? Yes. Can I turn secondly to look at your um, instructions? Uh, you've been given two sets of instructions by the inquiry legal team. Uh, the first of them uh, provided to you, I'm at paragraph 2.3, uh, on the 2nd of June 2022, and then addendum instructions on the 27th of July 2022. Is that right? Yes. And are those instructions fairly summarised? Can we display this, please? Paragraph 2.3.3 of your report, which is at page 7. At, uh, towards the foot of the page, 2.3.3. Uh, does that, um, in paragraph 2.3.3, in uh, little a, b, and c, uh, fairly summarise your instructions? Yes, it does. Namely, an introduction to the horizon system and other key terms that will seek to assist this inquiry in understanding the substance of your report and other submissions that might be made to the inquiry. And you were instructed that the introduction to the horizon system should be tailored so as to be understandable to the inquiry, the core participants to the inquiry, to members of the public who may not have prior knowledge of the Horizon IT system. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And is that essentially part one of your report? That is part one, yes. You were instructed to analyze and identify, um, sorry, and illustrate any themes in the problems that were being experienced by users in the period up to and including the rollout of the Horizon IT system, including how those problems were resolved or escalated and the key individuals who were involved in these processes. Is that essentially part two of your report? Yes. Taken together with the third thing, any overall observations or conclusions that were within your professional expertise as to the themes that you identified and the potential reasons for them? Yes. You say in your report that though, although those were your instructions and therefore provided the basis for the, determ for the determination of the scope of your work, you've nonetheless been responsible as an independent expert for developing your own approach to the questions posed by the instructions. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Did you undertake your review um, of the material between June and September this year? Yes assisted by a team from Alex Partners, including uh, colleagues in the United Kingdom? Yes. And they've assisted you, I think, with um, anglicising um, some of the um, phrases or turns of phrase in the report. Indeed, they did. Thank you. So spelling words like colour and um, defence and things like that, presumably. Yes. OK. <laughs> uh, in terms of the materials relied on, um, are they listed over pages 161 to 165 of your report? That's um, Appendix A, so 161 to 165. If we could turn those up, please. Thank you. Yes. And we can see on page 161 a, um, a list of pinnacles or peaks, and then over the page, please, to 162, we can see the list of um, pinnacles and peaks um, continued. Is that right? That is correct. Um, for now, I think it's um, sufficient to know that a pinnacle was a customised incident logging and resolution tracking system initially adopted by Fujitsu between, I think, 96 and 2003. That's correct. We'll come back to these in detail later. And then the peak was the customised incident logging system designed to replace Pinnacle in, I think, 2003. Yes. And this, um, these um, Pinnacles and Peaks were a selection taken, I think, from some 55,000 such documents that you were provided with. Yes. And I think, as you tell us in the report, you used 
computer-assisted technology to review that material. Is that right? That is correct. Because what you describe as a brute force approach wasn't possible and was inadvisable with that volume of data. Um, by brute force in this context, do you mean reading and analyzing every one of 55,000 error logs? That is exactly what I mean. Rather than the algorithm brute force? That, that's right. OK, got it. And then on 162, you continue by listing um, some monthly reports from Pathway and ICL Pathway. Yes. And then if we go to 163, please, we see those reports continue, and then a list of um, other background materials that you um, had regard to and then over the page to 164 and 165, some publicly available materials that you list. Yes. It, your work and therefore the observations and conclusions in the report and the evidence you'll give today are based only on the documentary evidence and data provided to you by the inquiry, which in turn was provided by some of the core participants. Is that right? Yes. And that was primarily Fujitsu, is that right? That is correct. And primarily in the period from July 96 to December 2000? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Can I turn thirdly to the scope of part one of your report and the evidence that's to be given um, today? Your instructions relate specifically to phase two of the inquiry and this is paragraph 2.4.2 .2 of your uh, report, and therefore um, address the procurement, design, pilot, rollout, and modification of and to the system. Yes. Uh, like this inquiry, you've adopted the um, umbrella term Horizon System and Horizon IT System that was employed by Mr. Justice Fraser in his Horizon Issues Judgment. Yes. Uh, which is, quote, the Horizon computer system, hardware and software, communications equipment in branch, and central data centers where records of transactions made in branches were processed. Is that right? That is correct. Now, I think um, part one of your report is itself divided into three parts. Um, sorry, four parts. In section three of your report, or the paragraphs beginning with three, you address the theory of system design and development. That is correct. And uh, just tell us why is that important, the, the, the theory um, of system design and development? Uh, understanding, uh, especially for people who are not familiar with uh, uh, the intricacies of system design, development, uh, deployment, and maintenance. Uh, it's important to have just a general overview of what goes into that um, and what to expect uh, from, from that process. So I felt it was important to just uh, spend a little bit of time in my report to explain some concepts that I feel will be uh, salient further on in the report. Thank you. And to be clear, that's... Um a theoretical or um, ideal situation that you set out, um, i.e. the paradigms of design, et cetera, rather than relating to this system. That's right. This is, this is all theory. It has nothing to do with, with the actual uh, documents I reviewed. In section four of your report, you introduce the horizon system. You explain in summary terms um, what the system is, how it was structured, and how the system evolved over time. Yes. And just by way of summary, on page nine of your um, report, um, at the paragraph at the top in the little A, B, and C, thank you, you detail in summary form the three major iterations of the Horizon system. Is this right? That is correct. Firstly, the original system introduced into branches from 1999 onwards and active until 2010, now known as Legacy Horizon, although presumably not uh, known as Legacy Horizon at that time. 
That is correct. And then the first major iteration of the Horizon Online system, known as HNG-X, which was introduced in 2010 and active until around 2017? Yes. And then the second major um, iteration of the Horizon Online system, introduced in about 2017 and still active today, HNG-A, which I think is the Horizon Anywhere. Yes. <coughs> The third thing you do in section five of your report, you introduce Horizon's error logging and remediation systems. Yes. And then in section six, you explain in more detail the materials provided to you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I turn to the limitations on your report? In paragraphs um, 2.7.1 to eight, which is on pages 10 and 11, of your report, you identify a series of limitations to your report and therefore of the evidence that you can give today and in November, is that right? That is correct. And um, I think summarising them, uh, there are I think six or seven of them. Firstly, the documentation on which you relied was a quarter of a century or so old, was written um, for an internal market and not for the purposes of subsequent forensic examination in legal proceedings, is that right? That is correct. Secondly, the documentation relates to uh, principally the period from 96 and 2000, reflecting the focus of your report being on the rollout of Legacy Horizon. Yes. Thirdly, given the um, nature, extent and duration over time of the Horizon system, you could have spent an unlimited amount of time researching and analysing it. Indeed, that is correct. I think you're going to tell us in a moment that the documentation related to Horizon, that's um, training manuals, operating instructions and the like, the Horizon documentation, itself amounts to over 100,000 documents. That is correct. So that's documents, not pages. Yes. Uh, fourthly, um, it was in the nature of the task that you undertook that you were focusing on material that tended to describe problems and difficulties rather than trumpeting the accomplishments of Horizon. Yes. Um, fifthly, is this right, given the technical nature of the error logs, pinnacles, peaks and kells, you may have missed nuances or subtle shades of the use of language within them which nuances and shades may have been uh, evident to those responsible for actually using the system. Yes, that is correct. At six, the pinnacles and peaks that you examined came from the third line of Fujitsu's IT support, and therefore you didn't examine records relating to the first and second lines of IT support. That is correct. And lastly, as you've observed already, most of the material you examined originated from Fujitsu and not the post office, and so you don't have any insight into Poles post office's views during the period which you're examining. That is correct. <coughs> Can we turn then um, to the first part of your report, which is um, section three on page 13? Can that be displayed, please? And can we um, highlight 3.1.1, please? Thank you. You say, and I'm going to read it into the record, that, um, to properly understand software systems, it is important to appreciate how they fit into the overall execution of the enterprise they support. Software systems are enablers, not panaceas. In the best situation, software applications can decisively improve the execution of the enterprise's strategy by streamlining operations. This often includes providing complete and accurate reporting that informs decision makers in a timely manner. In the worst situations, mismatched, mismatched expectations and or faulty designs and implementations 
degrade the execution of the enterprise. Can you um, explain what you were conveying in that um, paragraph, please? Uh, certainly. Um, uh, I believe uh, many people think that software cures everything, um, that, that software is the leader uh, of the execution of an enterprise. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that software is a tool that the enterprise should be using in order to execute uh, the strategy and tactics that it has predefined uh, rather than the other way around. The software does not define the strategy and tactics the software is a servant to the strategy and tactics of, of an enterprise. You then set out over the following paragraphs um, the five components that permit execution of the enterprise. And the first of those, the model components, is strategy. Can you explain what you mean by strategy, please? Uh, strategy, um, as I as I say, you know, in my in my uh, in my report, is uh, uh, the very high level driver of of what uh, you know uh, what what an enterprise is trying to accomplish and the way it's trying to accomplish it. Um, uh, this is often uh, used, you know, or often encapsulated in mission statements and vision statements, and it is a very uh, usually a very straightforward. Um, simple to understand um, a set of concepts that that is the uh, the the DNA basically uh, of an enterprise and what they're trying to do and, and in general how they're trying to accomplish it. So this is in the form of a mission statement or statement of purpose. It's focused on the organisation and not the IT system. That is correct. And you set out at the foot. It's on the page. At now at the foot of um, this page, um, the UK Post Office's statement of purpose as at the time that you were writing your report. And I think um, the top line of it is we're here in person for the people who rely on us. And it goes on to explain what it means by those um, three component parts. Yes. Um, we, we needn't read um, uh, those. But that is um, a post office strategy. Yes. You then explain over the page, please, the tactics or business operations of an enterprise. And you say in paragraph 3.2.2, I'll read it in, to execute the strategy, it is important to have a mature and well understood set of policies and procedures, designing, developing and implementing the tactical playbooks that control the day to day business operations across all aspects of the enterprise takes considerable effort. The balance between aspirational goals and realistic constraints is the responsibility of those put in charge of making quote real world end quote decisions that affect how an enterprise is operated. Uh, again, this, the tactics uh, need not refer to the IT system. That's correct. It might do, but does not necessarily do so. That's right. Um, and uh, the tactics would obviously be guided by the strategy. Yes. Uh, you explain um, as a third component part in paragraph 3.2.3 that uh, about the concepts of software systems. And you say a software system's sole purpose is efficiently to reinforce the business operations. That is correct. So the tactics um, select software systems based on their ability to conform to the defined business operations requirements of um, uh, the tactics and the strategy, is that right? Yes. Uh, you then uh, speak to the fourth component part, uh, paragraph 3.2.4, um, data management, brackets, facts. What did you mean by facts? Uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, information systems will uh, uh, be systems of record 
uh, for example, uh, if it's uh, an accounting transaction, it will record that transaction, and I would consider that particular set of data a fact uh, for the enterprise. And so the data management is governed by the design specifications of the software systems? Yes. You say in the second sentence there, the management of these facts rely, requires alignment of the software systems to the business operations and anticipates downstream analytics and reporting. Uh, what did you mean by that second sentence, please? So, so oftentimes uh, facts are accumulated in um, uh, a, a voluminous nature uh, and the uh, one of the benefits of having a software system collecting all of this information is to further analyze and report on it. In order to do that correctly, uh, number one, the software system has to direct the collection of data in a structured and understood manner uh, so that the reporting and analytics that can be performed on that uh, is well defined and well understood by everyone throughout the enterprise. Uh, you turn fifthly to analytics and um, uh, reporting. And this part of the model represents how the enterprise understands the data collected and managed through a series of um, <coughs> manipulations and summaries of the data itself. Is that right? That is correct. And those re uh, rely on the rules employed by the data management function? Yes. Uh, you explain the hierarchical relationship between these components in paragraph 3.4.2 of your report on page 15. And you say that the two concepts that should be considered that affect a healthy long-term relationship between the components are adaptability and complexity. And under um, adaptability in uh, A Roman 1, you say the downstream components should respond to the requirements of the upstream components, not dictate them. Can you explain, please, what you mean by downstream and upstream components? Uh, certainly. So, so the the relationship or, or the hierarchy um, uh, within the model that uh, we just went through uh, has a clear pecking order. Strategy guides the tactics. Tactics selects the software. Software controls the data management and, and the uh, data management supplies information to the reporting and analytics section. Uh, so, so that's the relationship uh, that I'm referring to. Which of those are downstream and upstream? So strategy is at the top of the hierarchy and reporting and analytics is at the bottom of the hierarchy. And what do you mean by um, not dictate them? Can, can you so, give an example? Yes. So, so what I mean is that there, there should never be an instance where, uh, let's say, the reporting and analytics uh, uh, defines what the strategy should be. Uh, the, the reporting and analytics should always be responsive to the strategy, not dictating <coughs> the strategy. Um, and, and that works the same up and down the hierarchy that I've described. The uh, software system should never dictate the tactics of a enterprise. The tactics of an enterprise should always uh, be in charge of the software system and what the software system does. You, give, you actually give an example in Roman 2 there. Um, could you flesh that out a little bit, please? Certainly. So in this example, um, uh, what I'm uh, describing is that if the reporting and analytics um, took it upon themselves to expand on the, um, uh, the information that was to be collected. In theory, that should have been guided by the tactics and, and then responsive by the, the computer, the, by the software system. It, it is possible that uh, there are situations where 
uh, someone in the reporting and analytics um, uh, division of this hierarchy felt as though, well, it would be very nice to have this particular piece of information available, um, but it's not being collected by the software system. So we're going to take it upon ourselves to start collecting that information. That, in the short run, uh, seemed, uh, could be a very good idea. However, uh, as that type of um, attitude towards uh, the enterprise goes on and on, you find that you're doing a lot of one-off ad hoc uh, additions uh, in the wrong place. And in this situation, I mean in the reporting and analytics of collecting information. Uh, and not necessarily everyone within the enterprise even knows that you're collecting that information. And they certainly aren't governing it. There, there aren't any rules governing the collection of that information, at least not from the, the purview of the, of the strategy or the tactics section. Uh, so uh, in my experience, what I found is when that happens, uh, it's almost as though a new kingdom has been set up in, in the wrong area of the hierarchy. And over time, it becomes disjointed with the strategy and tactics of, of, the, uh, of the enterprise. And it creates an unstable situation because once the, the strategy, you know, once, once the senior leaders or, or the line leaders uh, of a system are aware that this information is available and start relying on it, but it's not really being controlled properly through the software system or the data management uh, uh, component of the process, oftentimes the integrity of that information uh, uh, is not the best. And, and uh, the situation then arises that no one knows really who's in control of that information. No one, no one has uh, a view onto the efficacy of the information, and it's essentially out of control. The, 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 the process, you've introduced a lack of control into the process, and that has a lot of knock-on effects down the line. And any one addition like that seems fairly innocuous, but over time, it's, it's as though bile is, is being collected in the system and, and eventually things become very out of control if, if you are not uh, adhering to who's in charge and, and where the proper uh, division of labor should be for, for that particular uh, example. And I think you um, mentioned some species of that bile in um, the last sentence um, of Roman II inefficiencies of communication, maintenance, and costs. That, that's right, uh, because once once you start going down that path where, where you're out of control, um, as far as the collection, you know, the proper collection and maintenance of that data, uh, then people are expecting, like for instance, if this was done completely in the reporting and analysis section, uh, people further upstream, such as in the tactics or in the strategy section, might assume that it's being, uh, that is part of the software system or part of the data management system where it's not. Uh, and the data, man, you know, it, it's extremely inefficient to have multiple people doing the same thing. And, and what I'm trying to explain here is that as, as these lines are blurred, uh, no one knows really who has responsibility over the data, and no one knows where the data is coming from, which is the, the communications issue. And, and as systems are upgraded, so let's say that, that we did collect a whole bunch of extra data uh, in the reporting and analysis section, and then went through a change management, uh, a change process in the software and the data management section. <coughs> Excuse me, they have, they have no idea uh, that this other information is being collected and and they don't know how, uh, they wouldn't know how a change in the software or a change in the, the, the policies and procedures that are in the tactics section, or even a change in the data management uh, uh, portion of, of the hierarchy are affected by the expectation that this extra data is always being collected because they, in fact, might not even know that this data is being collected. Um, the second concept to which you refer to ensure a healthy long-term relationship between the component parts is complexity. And you say in paragraph B, Roman 1, current efficiency and future flexibility, 
benefit from complexity being localised as far downstream as possible. Can you explain, please, what you meant by that? Uh, certainly. So, so the uh, systems are complex. You know, running an enterprise is, is complex, um, but it's important for um, guiding principles at the top to then filter as it filters its way down through the, the hierarchy to uh, to then be more real world. Uh, the the concept of pushing complexity down as far as possible allows rapid changes to be made uh, to the system, uh, whereas opposed to if all of the complexity existed at the top of the hierarchy, it would, it would require a, a vast amount uh, of changes downstream because every, every change at the top cascades down. So to the extent that you can push down the complexity as far as possible, it limits the amount of adjustments that need to be done as things are changing you know, on the different parts of the hierarchy. Thank you. And again, in Roman 2, you give an example of not adopting that philosophy. Uh, can you um, remind yourself of that example and then um, try to explain it to us, please? All right. In this example, um, what I'm uh, the example I'm using is uh, uh, if a particular reporting requirement um, dictated by the tactics section uh, was inadvertently put into the software uh, selection section. Um, there, uh, the example I'm using is whether a particular uh, postal code is related to an offshore aisle or not. The, it is possible to locate that particular functionality within a software system. Uh, it certainly is, but that is a redundant piece of information uh, in my perspective. So for instance, you have a UK postal code and the tactics section might require an extra entry of checking off a box to say whether this postal code relates to an offshore aisle. You certainly can require your software system to record that, but the uh, the correct place to record that information is more in the data management uh, uh, system because because it is redundant. There is no need to introduce that into a user uh, uh, interface screen. Uh, the it's defined. It's predefined. Everyone you know uh, that that is something that can be managed further down in the hierarchy. Uh, if you did require the software to do that, here are the downfalls of that. So number one, the extra amount of, of coding that it would take just to, to implement that, that one little change. But the bigger issue is you are now allowing uh, the possibility for, uh, for uh, internally your data to, to not be correct. So you're giving the user the option of giving a postal code and, and a, a particular category or tag to that postal code. The user might put that in incorrectly. However, if you have that pushed down into the data management section and the data management section has a definition of each postal code and whether it is an offshore aisle, it's taken that labor off of the user it's taken the labor out of creating the software, and it's also uh, maintaining the integrity of, of the reporting that will be using that. In your answer there, you gave as one of the consequences of not adopting this approach um, the need for writing um, much more additional code, extra coding, I think you called it. Yes. What's the problem with, or is there a problem by um, having to write additional code? And if so, what is it? Well, the first problem is is that if that code is not necessary, uh, there, there's going to be a cost component to that code. Uh, so so that, that's the first problem. But the second problem really has more to do with uh, being having internal uh, uh, referential integrity uh, of the data, and that's what I just described. It is possible, if you put that in, to have data that doesn't agree with each other. If I have a particular postal code uh, that is related to London, 
and I have the option of checking it off as being an offshore aisle, I've just introduced a data error into the system. Uh, and then the third thing uh, would be the maintenance of that code, the maintenance of the software uh, to the extent it's ever upgraded uh, would have to take this extra coding into account and, and have uh, a knock-on effect of, of perhaps increasing the maintenance costs further down the line. Where does the concept of um, data-driven logic, something that you're going to speak about in a moment, I anticipate, uh, fit in with what you have just described? Uh, so data-driven data logic uh, would be what we just described as, as the proper placement for this particular example. It, it is uh, a reference table. Uh, in this example, it would be a reference table for all the postal codes. Uh, and instead of having something hard-coded in as software, we could have a table, a reference table, basically, which just basically means I have a list of all my UK postal codes, and then I have an indicator of whether that postal code should be considered an offshore aisle or not. And, and the people maintaining that particular database, uh, you know, what, you know, let's say that there was, you know, you had a new aisle, uh, all of a sudden pop up. Um, uh, it, it, it would be much easier to maintain that reference in the data management section rather than in the software uh, part of the hierarchy. Can we turn to systems development, please? And in paragraph 3.5.1 of your report, you make a point as to the distinction between the terms um, software and system. Could you explain that, please? Certainly, software um, uh, I, I would describe as application code. Application code is is what uh, controls all the hardware, but a system is is a, is a more universal term, which includes hardware and um, uh, communications and, and, and a number of other things. It's not simply just the software. It's not just the application code. It's the universal system of all the components uh, uh, that are related. So, uh, for instance, uh, you know, making sure that your communication lines are working right, making sure that your printers are working right, making sure that any other pieces of hardware uh, related uh, to the that the system is included. So, um, the system is how the software and the hardware um, operate together. Yes, that is correct. Um, and a subset of that is the software, and that's the system or the part of the system most often known as an application that directs, in particular, the computer's hardware. Yes, that is correct. You explain in paragraph 3.5.5 um, the nature of um, hardware devices. I wonder whether we could um, look at that, please. And I appreciate that to you, a lot of this may be uh, very basic indeed, as indeed to a number of people listening um, or watching online. But um, I want to take it at this level right at the beginning of the inquiry for a reason, please. Uh, you um, uh, mention a series of hardware devices, and you um, uh, categorize them as, um, firstly, input devices. Can you give some examples of those, please? Uh, certainly, uh, as I say in my report, uh, keyboards, uh, mice, uh, touchscreens, card readers, uh, and in fact, even some sort of storage devices uh, at times will act as an input device. Secondly, you categorize um, some processing devices. Can you explain those and give some examples, please? Uh, certainly. The, the CPU of the computer or the brain of the computer is, is, is the main processing device. Uh, storage devices, thirdly, can you explain those and give some um, uh, examples? Sir, uh, hard drives, memory, um, you know, like CD-ROMs, uh, anything that uh, uh, retains, uh, uh, that persists information. And is it right that a, um, a storage device could be either an output or an input device? That's correct. And could you um, yeah, perhaps give us an example of that? Uh, certainly. So, so if um, um, if you are um, working on a spreadsheet uh, that perhaps you saved yesterday, um, you as you pull up that spreadsheet, it's referencing the hard drive uh, to pull up the information that's on the spreadsheet. So at that point in time, 
your hard drive is considered an input device because that's where your application is receiving information from. Then as you make uh, changes to that spreadsheet and, and are done for the day and save it, that same, that same hard drive uh, is being saved to and at that point it, uh, it turns into an output device. You say in your report, where you indeed give that example, even in this very basic explanation, we can foretell the bleeding of meanings. What did you mean by that? So what, what I mean by that is that depending on the context of what we're talking about uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, the course of any discussion about uh, something as complex as systems development and deployment and maintenance, uh, uh, you really need to uh, understand the particulars and the details uh, uh, of the situation at hand to, to <coughs> fully understand uh, uh, the, uh, the implications of, of, of what's going on. In paragraph um, 3.6 of your report, you give an overview of the different types of software. Um, these, as you explain, sometimes interact with the hardware of a system, and sometimes they interact with other software, and sometimes they interact with the user of a system. And you set out the four main categories of software. The first is an operating or OS um, software sorry, operating system or OS software. Can you please explain that and give some examples? Um, certainly. Um, so some examples would just be like Microsoft Windows or Linux um, or Mac's, uh, Mac OS, which is Apple's operating system. Uh, and essentially what, what this does is it provides the interface between uh, the hardware and, and everything else that happens on the system. It, it's where uh, device driver sits. It's 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 basically how it, it's 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 the rule book for how the hardware of that particular system is going to interact with any other bit of software. You say in your report the operating um, system software is the low level software um, that allows the software to interact with the computer's hardware. What do you mean by low level software? Um, it, it's it's the baseline software that uh, that basically uh, is the is the train conductor for everything that happens on the computer. And what I mean by that is it it, it allows uh, everything to interact with the hardware because ultimately you know a, a, a computer is a piece of hardware and and there could be multiple different pieces of hardware on that computer. The operating system is is the level of of instructions that allow the hardware to interact with anything else that, that uh, is on that particular computer. The um, next species of software that you um, describe is a database management system, or DBMS. Can you please explain that and give some examples of it? Certainly. Um, so, uh, so oftentimes uh, uh, it's needed to, uh, uh, systems need to collect and organize information in a structured manner. And uh, the database management system software helps to do this. Uh, oftentimes, it's in a structured, but it doesn't always have to be in. Uh, uh, and when I say structured, I'm, I'm really referring to like tabular formats. Uh, you can often think of uh, a database management system as being a series of tables uh, that hold information and can be and have relationships to other tables. Um, so uh, like an example would be uh, perhaps I have a, um, a sales system and that sales system I want to know who all my customers are. So there might be a table that holds just customer information and, and a reference key for that customer information. But it might also have a different table that uh, keeps track of all of the sales I've made to that customer. So what a database management system does is it tries to organize that information in a way that uh, minimizes the amount of space it takes to, uh, to record all that information uh, and allows me to do some uh, analyses on that information. You give examples um, or, uh, as Microsoft's SQL Server 
and the Oracle database. Can you explain those, what they do? C certainly. Uh, they do exactly uh, what I just described. Uh, so Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle database are both uh, examples of relational database systems. Uh, that would be the more tabular uh, structured form, and, and they really underpin most um, uh, large, uh, like accounting systems and ERP systems. What's uh, an ERP system? Uh, enterprise relationship uh, 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 platform system that it, it's it, it's it's the general uh, uh, software that helps run an enterprise. So so it usually includes your general ledger as well as any other accounting subsystems like uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, your. Uh, you know, your, your inventory system, uh, you know, any, like an SAP uh, would be an example of an ERP system. Um, what's an SAP? SAP, <laughs> SAP is, uh, uh, is, is a brand named uh, ERP system uh, that basically helps run your enterprise. So, so it, it will do everything from financial to operational um, uh, services for your enterprise and in theory is integrated so it allows all of those different systems to uh, uh, speak to each other. Uh, the third species that you describe is um, application software. Can you please explain what you mean by ap application software and then give us um, some real world examples? Certainly. Um, so uh, an applicate that that is a very general term. Uh, uh, you know, if you ask me to sit down and, and create an address book for you uh, to, to keep uh, keep your calendar and keep your contacts, if I programmed it for you, I would consider that a piece of application software. Uh, the SAP system uh, that we just talked about, I would consider that a piece of application software. Usually, it is a, a piece of software that is built for a specific business or or maybe even non-business purpose. Uh, but it usually is, is custom built for a particular um, uh, purpose. Uh, even things like uh, Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, I would consider those app pieces of application software. Even though they're not built for a specific business. That's right. But they are built for a specific purpose. Um, lastly, fourthly, you describe um, uh, the fourth species, application development software. Uh, can you um, please explain what application development software is and give us some examples? Certainly. So, um, so if you were to ask me to build you, you know, a contact tracking system, uh, perhaps I might want to use uh, what I'm referring to here as as an application development software system. And, and what that what that is is it is a piece of it's it's a set of uh, software packages that allow programmers to efficient, efficiently design, develop, deploy, and maintain software. So it's specific to, uh, to systems development, design, and deployment, uh, and it supports those, uh, you know, that, that effort in, in organizing all the code, organizing the releases, um, and, and keeping track of that. And I believe that I've, uh, you know, like Microsoft, Microsoft has a, uh, a studio, it's, it's called Visual Studio. It, it is an application development software, and uh, Android also has a studio. If you wanted to, so if I wanted to de deploy <coughs> a mobile app on Android, I could use Android Studio's application development software uh, package to help me do that. So it's software for writing? Yes, it's software for writing software. And yes. maintaining and amending and changing software. Exactly. You um, express a caveat at 3.6.2 that there are many other types of software, but those four categories um, allow you in this report to illustrate how software types interact with each other. Yes, that is correct. Uh, do you give an example at 3.6.3? And can you just explain that to us, please? Uh, certainly. So, so in this uh, example, um, I'm talking about if we are developing an accounting application, uh, the first thing that we would use uh, as the developers of the accounting application would be the application development software to do that. And uh, knowing that uh, accounting uses uh, a lot of, you know, or, or expects a lot of transactional information, I would also expect that a database management uh, uh, systems piece of software would be used to help record and, and retain that, that information. Um, both of those would be um, obviously, uh, as I said before, interacting with the, op uh, the operating system. 
uh, software. Uh, and as it was developed, all of that uh, would be considered an application. Thank you. In paragraph um, 3.7 and following of your report, you explain to us the concept of the software development life cycle or the system development life cycle, in both cases shortened to the acronym SDLC. Uh, could you explain the, uh, the difference, if there is any difference, between software um, DLC and system DLC? Certainly. Um, much like we discussed uh, uh, a few moments ago, the, uh, the distinction is if, if it was just software, I would be concerned only about the application code here. But uh, uh, taking a more universal view on the topic, and I want to, as, as, the, as a system is deployed, it is not simply just the software. Um, if I want to take into account uh, things like hardware and communications and, and all of the things outside of the purview of just the software, I'd want to describe it as a systems development life cycle. And you focus in your report on the latter of those, the system development life cycle, is that right? That is correct. And you explain that although there were a variety of approaches um, in practice across teams, there are seven commonly new used stages. Is that right? That is correct. Um, the first of those is planning, uh, although that may be obvious from the word. Can you explain in this context what is meant by it? it yes. Uh, so, so planning, uh, as I say uh, in my report, uh, this is the stage that determines what's being requested and trying to just put together an overarching plan of how you would approach uh, uh, fulfilling that particular request. And it is very closely uh, uh, joined with the next section, with this, which is the analysis. So I would almost uh, talk, uh, distinguish these two as, as much like the strategy and the tactics of a particular development uh, of a system. You say that analysis, secondly, is the stage where the design team gathers as much information as possible about every detail of the requested system and covers issues such as functionality, performance, equipment and cost. Is that right? That is correct. And then the third stage, um, design. Can you explain what's uh, involved in that stage, please? Certainly. Um, uh, the design um, is basically the roadmap for how you are going to achieve the goals set out in the planning and analysis stage. Uh, this, uh, this includes a lot of different things. Um, it, uh, uh, it, it, it's considering uh, both the architecture of just the software as well as how the, um, uh, what hardware is required and making sure that the design of the software is properly accounting for the required hardware uh, that's associated with the system, including uh, communications, including um, all of the upstream and downstream processes. So for instance, uh, I might want to uh, bifurcate or, or trifurcate uh, my, my design into here is what the user is going to see here is what um, uh, the uh, the operational um, uh, the operations of, of the communications between uh, perhaps a, a bunch of satellite users and a central repository of information that's going to be collecting all that information for users. It, it, we need to understand what is going to be how this information is going to be consumed what needs to be done with it uh, it's it is trying to take a very uh, structured rigorous approach to understanding not only what is being requested right now but also perhaps some uh, an anticipating <coughs> that changes might be required in the future so kind of baking that into uh, the, the structure of the way it, uh, this system is designed right now to accommodate, hopefully, uh, you know, reasonably anticipatable uh, future requests. You say um, in this paragraph, if an external resource is determined to be appropriate, 
and integration portion of the design will be documented. What did you mean by that? Certainly. So, so oftentimes, uh, especially on large projects uh, or complex projects, uh, uh, the team that is uh, that has assumed the role of the uh, general contractor for a p particular piece of software or, or a system, uh, I should say rather. Uh, might not need to develop every bit of, of, uh, of, of technical feature uh, uh, from scratch. They might be aware that there are uh, components that exist right now from people outside of their particular um, uh, uh, programming staff that that functionality already exists. So to the extent that they get to uh, a buy or make decision, they might decide that they would prefer to go out there, uh, out to the market and, and purchase an existing piece of technology and incorporate that into the system that they're developing. If they do that, uh, they, need to be, uh, they need to be well coordinated with that third party that is providing a particular function or a particular feature that's going to be incorporated into the system uh, so that Everyone knows exactly what's expected. Everyone knows, uh, uh, you know, the tech because there's a lot of technical details when when you're inter when you, when you're incorporating someone else's piece of software or someone else's solution for a particular function of your system. It's very important that everyone understand exactly what's expected from both sides, so so that it operates correctly when you actually fold everything together and deliver what you're calling a system. Thank you. Um, the fourth stage is development, and you uh, explain that using the technical design document from the previous stage, the development team will transform the design into to a functioning system. Right. So, so this is where um, where it goes from theoretical to practical. This is the de once the design document has been created, uh, it is then used as basically the recipe book for the development team to actually code the software, to do the integration of the hardware with the software that will create the system. And that will include, you know, hardware such as, you know, printers or touch screens, but as well as making sure that uh, things like communication systems are working properly so that uh, all, all the different components of the software, uh, uh, all the components of the design uh, many of which are software, but are connected by different hardware pieces. So, so the development is is taking the design, uh, which is uh, the, the theoretical guideline, the, the, the theoretical roadmap for the system, and actually turning it into a real piece of, of a real system, which includes all all the hardware and software components. And to be clear, clear, this is the stage at which code writing or coding occurs? That is correct. Um, the fifth stage is um, testing. And you say this phase is used to ensure that the results of the development phase align with the expected functionality, performance, and hardware described by the technical design document. I is this um, phase an important one, the testing phase? Oh, yes, uh, of course it is. Um, uh, the, uh, the design provides the roadmap. The development is the actual application of that roadmap to, to make something, uh, to make a real piece of, uh, of uh, a real system, which includes the software. Um, but we need to make sure it works correctly. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, there is, is always a rigorous testing process that uh, accompanies the initial um, uh, deployment uh, of the software uh, or, or of the system. You explain that there are uh, two levels of testing, quality assurance, QA, and then user accepting um, testers, UAT, yes? Y yes, yes. So, so oftentimes, or, or, or most of the time, the, the testing First is done internally uh, uh, by the same group that is writing the software. And uh, there's a division of labor within that group. Usually there are the developers, well, there's the designers, but there's the developers. And then there is a different group 
uh, within that particular firm that will test it. Uh, they need, it's important that they be independent of the development group uh, uh, for multiple reasons, but, but the most important one is they need to have an independent view on, on whether the system that was created by the development group actually adheres to all the design specs that came out of the design group. Uh, so you have, you have an internal team that will go through a battery of tests. Um, uh, it's usually uh, a, a very rigorous set of tests that, that make sure that everything that they see in the actual development of the system adheres to the design specifications that, that was given to the developers, but independently verified by the testing group, by what I'm calling QA, quality assurance. You um, have sometimes spoken in the present tense there. To what extent was um, that which about you just spoke commonplace uh, 20, 25 years ago? I would say that uh, as long as software has been developed, in my experience, uh, which has been since the, the 90s, that uh, a QA function has also existed. And you emphasize that this group should be a separate group of professionals, but within um, the um, uh, development and design team. Yes, yes, it, it's, it's, it's not the developers. Yes. But it is from the same enterprise as the developers. Yes, the same company. Yes. And you said it should be independent. What, uh, I think you emphasize why that was. You said there's a range of reasons, presumably not marking one's own home, homework. Is, is one reason. Right. I, I mean, practically speaking, uh, even, you know, even when you're um, uh, writing a report, it's always good to get a fresh set of eyes on the report to see things that perhaps you're blind to. Um, uh, so, so that's just a practical um, uh, aspect of having an independent group of people do the same thing in the context of, of software and systems. It, it's just good to get a fresh set of eyes on something. It's also... Uh, uh, good to have an independent group because their roles are different. The, uh, the structure and rigor around a group of programmers that do testing is different than the structure and rigor of, the, uh, of a group of programmers that do development. Uh, the second species of um, testing or level of testing uh, you describe as user acceptance testing, a small group of users from the group requesting the system then performs real-world testing to make sure the system meets their expectations. And can you explain that in a little more detail, what, what's, uh, what's involved? Uh, certainly. So, so once uh, a system has uh, gained approval by the quality assurance group of testing, the first group of testers, uh, a company would have two options. We can either roll this software out to the entire user community or we can roll it out to a very small group of users to make sure that it's acceptable to them. Uh, the, the benefit of rolling out to a small group of users is to identify uh, operational issues. Um, uh, is, is, this, is this system understandable to you? As well as to catch maybe some errors that slip through the cracks of, of, of the quality assurance. The, uh, the reason I said it was a benefit is uh, oftentimes the user community and the developer community are two completely divorced communities. What, what the design and development team might think of as a great way to operationalize something in a system might not be as appetizing to actual users of that system. And if you roll it out to a small group of users in this user acceptance testing, you get the opportunity to get uh, more stylistic feedback as well as doing one extra level of testing to make sure that, that the functioning of, of the software or, or the system is performing as needed. You um, explain in... Um uh, this paragraph that um, often there are certain benchmarks that define whether the system can be permitted to go to the next stage, the deployment stage, i.e. a written down, recorded set of criteria. Is mm. that right? That's correct. 
um, and you explain that the system does not need to be perfect um, to be deployed, but it needs to be acceptable to the user community. That is correct. And so one will often see criteria developed and the performance and operability and functionality of the system measured against those criteria. That is correct. <coughs> Uh, the next stage is um, um, deployment. Uh, can you explain what, what happens at that stage, please? So once, once user acceptance uh, testing has passed, uh, has, has given the system a, a passing mark, it's now, it's now time to take this system and make it accessible to the entire anticipated user community. Uh, and deployment is that process where you are now rolling out this software to the entire population uh, of users anticipated, you know, uh, 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 through, through this process. You know, when, 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 when the software gets, um, uh, when the agreement to make the software happens, you anticipate what the entire user community is. The user acceptance training uh, testing uh, was, was a small set of it. The deployment is talking about now rolling it out to everyone, making sure that, uh, or, or allowing everyone to access this particular system. You explain that um, this can be done in stages or all at once. That is correct. Uh, depending on the circumstances, uh, sometimes it is, um, it is uh, advisable to go ahead and release this particular system to everyone all at once. Other times, uh, maybe there are logistical issues that, that, uh, that make it more advisable to, I want to roll, roll this out to 10% of the user community this week, 10% next week, 10% the, the week after. It, it just might be a, a logistical issue. Um, but but both, both, um, both deployment uh, strategies or both deployment um, uh, uh, options are available, and it really just depends on uh, agreement between uh, the people contracting for that system and and, and the uh, the people delivering the system. Uh, you say that this stage involves the delivery of um, documentation to users concerning the operation of the system. Yes. So so as the as the um, system is rolled out, um, uh, you will off you will then also need to make sure that the proper support for for the users exists, and that is usually <coughs> in two forms. Usually a user guide. And access to uh, you know a help facility, um, meaning either uh, you know uh, uh, a phone call to a help desk, uh, an email, some sort of communication mechanism to the extent that that users do experience issues that they have something besides the documentation. Uh, they should refer to the documentation first, but to the extent that that's not helping them in, in their particular situation, they need to have uh, uh, access to someone else that can help them in real time. You describe this as a, a contract mechanism for the system's help desk. What did you mean by that, a contract mechanism? Uh, a contact mechanism? Ah, contact it, mechanism. Yes. I yes. misread the word. Yes. Uh, so, so You've just described it. Yes. Please it, ignore it, that question. It, it, it's how, how you get in touch with the help desk uh, to, to the extent that, uh, that you need the help. Uh, you um, included in the answer before last a um, a mention of the need for training as part of this stage. Yes. So depending on how complex the system is, um, uh, in addition to the uh, to the training manuals and, and the uh, uh, and access to a help desk, it it could require training, uh, uh, especially if this uh, particular system represents kind of a paradigm shift. You know, you're moving a lot of people from doing something that they used to do one way or never did at all and are just not familiar with the entire concept of, of what we're trying to achieve here and how the software is or the system is helping you achieve that. Training is, is, is another avenue to make sure that the users uh, are well situated to uh, to employ and utilize the system. And then the last stage um, is maintenance of the system when it's in use. Yes, yes. So so maintenance. Um, uh, so even once we've 
we've gotten to the point where the system has gone through all the testing, all the training is happening, and, and uh, the user community is interacting with the system. Uh, there is a possibility that uh, the users uh, have identified um, some bugs or errors in the system, in which case those bugs and errors need to be addressed. It also, uh, usually when a system is rolled out and, and to the extent that, that uh, the user community is excited about the system and sees the potential and, and, um, uh, of other things that the system can do, the, the ability uh, uh, for the users to communicate those desires for new functionality uh, usually is collected during this point. And, and the maintenance, uh, therefore, is twofold. One, if there are errors uh, or, or there are bugs in the system, it, it's to allow for the correction of the bugs. It's also to uh, act as a collection of uh, basically wish lists of things that the system could do in the future uh, to the extent that everyone agrees that it's, a, it's, it's proper to go ahead and create a different version of the system. Can we just complete this section of your report before the morning break? In paragraph 3.8.1, you describe or explain how over time there has been an evolution of how the stages of um, SDLC are modeled. And you describe, I think, the oldest model as being uh, a waterfall um, concept. Um, can you please explain what that involved? Uh, yes. Uh, so in... in uh, in, in the past, um, a waterfall uh, methodology was often employed, a uh, waterfall SDLC methodology was employed, which basically said, I want to try to do everything in a monolithic fashion. I want to know every design aspect and get that set. I want to develop everything um, uh, in that is described in the design concept. Uh, basically, I want to do everything in each stage and not move on to the next stage until the prior stage is complete. So that's the old way of doing it. In more recent times, uh, what has happened is people uh, or, or, or development communities have broken up the design, development, and deployment into smaller chunks. So they're not necessarily creating the entire system at once, but they're creating components of the system at once and trying to move those component, those bite-sized chunks through uh, user acceptance and, and, and um, or, or through design, development, um, testing, uh, and maintenance in smaller chunks. Uh, and th that, what that does is it allows kind of a, a, a trickle effect of, of getting the system out into the user community a little faster, although be it in smaller functional chunks than the entire system at once. You described that as agile development. Yes. Would uh, something we've seen in the papers here um, called either um, inquiry papers rather than the newspapers, um, rapid application development technique um, be a form of agile development? Uh, yes, yes. So, so there's lots of different flavors and there's lots of different nuances, but, but, but essentially uh, uh, what I'm trying to describe here is that, is that you can, there are many different approaches to doing systems development lifecycle and oftentimes they, they're really around how quickly we want to get things through, what level of acceptance is required, maybe, maybe in a rapid um, uh, level of acceptance. You don't, you don't need it to be as perfect as in a waterfall level, level of acceptance. <coughs> That's really a stylistic and taste choice on both the developer end and as well as the user end. Uh, and that's just something that is, uh, th there's, there's a constant, th there's a much more frequent feedback loop in the rapid development as opposed to the waterfall method. I, I described it in opening as um, an approach to software development that focuses more on ongoing software projects and user feedback and less on following a strict plan of development and testing cycles. Yes. Does that sound about right? That does sound right. Thank you. On that happy note, um, can we break for the morning, um, please, sir, if it suits you? just coming up to um, 25 past. Can we say um, 22 or quarter two, sir? 
Well, Mr. Scipione, you are asking, answering very many questions. How much of a break would you like? I'm very happy to extend the break till 11.45 if that suits you. We can yes. keep going. Yes, thank you very much. 11.45, thank you. So we'll break till 11.45, thank you. Okay. Oh, good morning, sir. Can you um, see and hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, and we can see and hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Scipione, can we turn to um, section four of your report, which starts on page 21? Um, in this section of uh, your report, you set out a summary um, of the post office and its branches, a summary of the services available at post office branches, a summary of the Horizon IT system, looking first at the components of Legacy Horizon, which you describe as components A to D. Then you look at the components of Horizon Online, again describing them as components A to D. And then you deal with the important activities or the important concepts of um, remming up or, and uh, rolling over, remming in or rolling over. Um, in order um, to provide uh, those summaries, is it right that you have drawn on the documents set out in paragraph 4.1.3 of your report, um, which um, I would ask to be displayed? See so if you just scroll down, please. Thank you. Um, in A to F. Yes. And so those six documents that um, are listed there are the um, essential bases for what you say by way of summary? Yes. Uh, you enter a caveat at the foot of the page at paragraph 4.1.4, <coughs> uh, in which you say, I've endeavoured to summarise these documents to what I consider an appropriate level of detail for the inquiry, but this has necessarily required me to omit some of the extensive technical details. Um, uh, and you um, explain that one document runs to 819 pages and another document runs to 417 pages. Yes. Um, uh, so you have summarized, but hopefully not um, oversimplified. That was the intent. Can we start then with the post office um, and its branches at um, paragraph 4.2, please? You explain that although the formal company name and structure of the post office has changed several times over the course of the past few decades, it's remained in essence a government-owned company responsible for operating a network of branches throughout the United Kingdom in which it offers post and other services to the general public. Yes. And between 1986 and 2001, the part with which we are most concerned was um, called Post Office Counters Limited, or POCL, as you describe them? Yes. Um, from 2001, it was known as um, Post Office Limited. Yes. You explain in your paragraph 4.23 um, the three different species of um, post office branches. Um, firstly, Crown Office branches, and you explain that these are... Um, uh, these branches are directly managed by Post Office Counters Limited and are known as, quote, Crown Post Offices. They're run by employees of Post Office Counters Limited, uh, and uh, um, such employees are commonly known as Crown Office Employees. <coughs> yes. Uh, the second species are agency post offices, and can you explain what you understood agency post office branches to be? Uh, my understanding is that these are um, uh, branches that are located in um, uh, shops or other uh, uh, facilities around the UK and are uh, where uh, post office services can be offered uh, by the shopkeepers. Uh, and the distinction is that the branches were owned by the sub-postmasters who were agents of Post Office Counters Limited? Yes. And then the third species are um, outreach services. Um, and you describe these as typically being small part-time branches that may use a village hall or mobile van to provide post office services to communities that might not otherwise receive them. Yes. 
you um, in a graph, if we can go over the page, please, um, which is your figure 4.21, and if we could um, enlarge just the graph, please. Thank you. Uh, we can see the changing nature of those three species of branches depicted in this um, figure um, uh, 4.1. And I think um, this describes um, how many thousands of each type of branch there were for the period um, 2000 to 2021. Yes. And I think, it, would this be right, it shows firstly, um, the data shows firstly, a decline in the overall number from about 18,000 odd um, to less than 12,000 odd. That is correct. Um, it, it would show secondly, a decline in the number of Crown Office branches. That's the purple on the graph. Yes. And you, I think you make the point in your report, it's paragraph 4.25, no need to look it up at the moment, that although um, certainly in 2003 the Crown Office branches represented only 3% of the overall estate, the Post Office said that they accounted for over 20% of transactions by volume. That is correct. And I think the third thing we could probably take from this graph is that the um, number of outreach services that were offered um, grew very substantially from 2000 up until um, 2021. They're depicted by the dark green on this graph. Yes. In um, paragraph, that can be taken down, thank you. Um, in paragraph, um, 4.3 of your report, you explain the services available at post office branches. And you say at one time it was estimated that some 170 services um, uh, were offered. And they include the well-known services listed in your seven paragraphs um, A to G. And these are all um, examples of what you describe as transactions. What do you mean uh, by the phrase transactions? Uh, tra in, the, in the context of the horizon system, um, as each one of these services uh, were, were, were engaged, on, engaged upon uh, by the customers uh, uh, through, uh, through the horizon system, uh, they would generate a transaction that would need to be recorded within the horizon system. So essentially a transaction in this context is any event in which a customer used a post office service in a branch that needed to be recorded in a system. That is correct. You make the point later in your report, it's um, uh, paragraph 4.3.6, no, no need to turn it up on the screen, but that um, not all transactions were internal to post office counters limited. Is that right? That is correct. And is that because Post Office Counters Limited was providing services to clients, some in the public sector and some in the private sector? Yes. Can you give some examples of services provided to um, public sector clients? Um, uh, in 436, uh, I uh, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency uh, and the Department of Works and Pensions um, would have been uh, public sector clients. And private sector clients, can you give some examples of those, please? Uh, uh, Camelot, uh, British Telecom would be examples. And I think you uh, mentioned Gyrobrank, too. Yes. Uh, and that meant that some of the money that was collected in branch would need to be sent to or, or indeed obtained from such clients. Um, but that was done by Post Office Counters Limited. Is, is that right? That is correct. You make the point in paragraph 4.3.7 that it was important to keep a record in the branch of all such transactions so that Post Office Counters Limited could work out which clients it needed to pay money to or claim money from, as well as ensuring that its own cash and stock was accounted for. Is that right? That is correct. 
and you explain in paragraph 4.3.8 that before um, Horizon was introduced, a number of branches would record their transactions in paper form, in ledgers or other similar documents, or use their own electronic point of sale or EPOS systems, one of which was called um, EcoPlus. Yes. And the EcoPlus system, is that essentially the brand name or product name of the supplier of that system? That is my understanding, yes. Uh, when we mention transactions in this context, they um, do not include occasions, is this right, where a customer purchases an item in a shop that is co-located with the post office, like confectionery or bread and milk or a newspaper? That is correct. Uh, the, the post office uh, transactions or, or the POCL transactions were taken care of on the horizon counter. Uh, all of the shop transactions were taken care of on it, through a different method. So the transactions that I mentioned or of the type that I've just mentioned would be processed separately from those of the post office branch, often via a separate counter? Yes. And so... Um, perhaps a number of us have experienced it. If you wanted to buy a book of stamps and a newspaper, you've got to get in two queues um, sequentially. Yes. As we've seen from your table, the um, majority of post office branches were agency branches. Uh, they were owned and managed by sub-postmasters. Yes. And the cash and the stock was owned by Post Office Counters Limited, but managed day to day by the sub postmasters. Yes. Can we turn, please, to um, the Horizon system? And uh, turn up paragraph 4.4.1. .4 Thank you. Uh, you explain that the system was introduced in stages, uh, known as sometimes as a rollout, between 1999 and 2000, and that the objective, as you understand it, of the Horizon IT system implementation was to modernise the point of sale and managerial accounting functions across the network of post office branches. Today, we might describe this process as digitising the branch network. Yes. You explain that the Horizon system is still in use today, albeit it's gone through the um, three main iterations that we have previously discussed in its 22-year or so lifetime. Yes. Can we begin with um, the Horizon system, um, and we're going to call it Legacy Horizon, as it um, became to be known? and turn over the page to paragraph 4.5. And the table at 4.1, um, thank you. You kindly um, set out a brief history of Legacy Horizon on, uh, or in this table at 4.1. Uh, can we just um, run through it, please, so that we've got the um, larger milestones in mind at this early stage of the inquiry, please. And again, this is extracted from the document set that you mentioned earlier on, is that right? Yes, that is correct. So um, if you can start, please, um, using this table to narrate these 10 or so developments in the um, uh, history of Legacy Horizon. Uh, certainly. So, uh, as you can see, the first entry, uh, May of 96, the DSS and POCL jointly awarded the contract uh, for, uh, to ICL Pathway uh, for what we're calling Horizon, uh, although you can see that there are a number of different variations of that name in here, uh, Pathway Project, Pathway Horizon, and, and, and so on. Um, and... Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, ICL Pathway at the time was a wholly owned subsidiary of ICL. Uh, Fujitsu uh, acquired 80% of ICL shares in 1990 and purchased the remainder in 1998. 
uh, and ICL was fully integrated into Fujitsu in 2002 and renamed Fujitsu Services Limited. And so just before moving on there, this contract, the May 96 one, was a contract to develop an IT system that would firstly replace the existing paper-based method of paying social security benefits and um, secondly automate uh, the entire national network of post offices. Is that right? I I indeed. Yes. Um, can you move on to September 1996, please? Sure. That uh, in September of 96 uh, was the initial go, go live um, that was implemented in the 10 post office branches. Uh, and this was uh, an interim uh, system for child benefit payments um, and uh, was limited to that functionality. In November of 97, uh, that system was extended to 200 post office branches. Um, uh, still just remaining, uh, the functionality just being the, the child benefit payments. Uh, and uh, it was noted uh, in my documentation that the deadline for completion of the operational life trial of the IT system was missed by ICL PL. That's um, um, at that time ICL Pathway Limited. Yes. Thank you. Uh, in March of 98, uh, an interdepartmental working group was established to review the viability of the pathway project and the consequences of cancellation. Uh, the working group comprised officials from Treasury, Cabinet Office, Department of Trade and Industry, and the DSS. In July of 1998, the interdepartmental working group reported that the pathway project remained feasible but required successful rene renegotiation of the contract with ICLPL. In October of, 98, of 1998, attempts to renegotiate the terms of the contract between DSS, POCL, and ICLPL failed. In May of 1999, the original PFI contract awarded to ICLPL by DSS and, and POCL was terminated. The DTI announced a new partnership agreement between POCL and ICLPL. In July of 99, POCL and ICLPL agreed a fixed payment contract uh, to automate the national network of post offices. And in late 1999, the rollout of Horizon uh, occurred or commenced. You um, mentioned earlier in your evidence this morning um, one of the two stages of um, testing or levels of testing um, was UAT, user acceptance testing. Yes. So far as you know, um, would that refer to the stages on this table of September 96 and November 97? Yes, that would be user acceptance testing. You're correct. Thank you. Can we turn, um, we can take that table down, please, um, to the functionality of Legacy Horizon. We're moving to paragraph 4.5.2 of your um, report. And you explain that there are essentially two elements to it, um, the first of which is the electronic point of sale or the EPOS um, element. Can you explain what the purpose and the function of the EPOS was? Uh, the purpose and function of the electronic point of sale uh, component of Horizon was uh, simply to capture the transactions that occurred at the branches uh, 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 throughout the network. So it, it included the purchases of post office products, such as um, stamps and stationery, made by customers in branch, is that right? That is correct. And also transactions carried out in branch for the purposes of products or the use of services um, provided by clients of the post office and the clients here are the things you've mentioned already or the organizations you've mentioned already some public sector clients um, DVLA DWP um, some private sector clients banks or Camelot that's correct you um, explain secondly that um, the purpose and function of the Horizon IT system uh, was um, one of management accounting. Can you explain what that is, please? 
Certainly. So, um, so the transactions uh, that were collected at each one of the branches for uh, 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 throughout the network uh, uh, needed to be consolidated and organized for, for purposes of doing all of the managerial accounting. And what I mean by managerial accounting is uh, I, I would consider the transactions operational um, uh, details of the operations of, of the uh, of POCL's agents, uh, as well as, as their crown offices. Uh, all of those transactions, uh, all of those transactions needed to be organized in order for POCL to do their own internal accounting, as well as exchange information with, with all of their clients. So the managerial accounting was a step in that process to collect all of the transactions and manage them uh, in order to supply further processes that needed to be done for their own internal financial accounting as well as to exchange information with all of their client partners. Thank you. Um, you explain in paragraph 4.5.3 that um, in terms of the size and scale of the data processed and the code written, uh, both were substantial? Yes, they were. Uh, you tell us that in um, 2003, the post office stated that Horizon processed nearly 2 billion transactions um, per annum. Yes. Uh, but despite that, you say that um, it was a relatively simple Task computationally. Yes, the, the each individual um, transaction, uh, or there there weren't any complex calculations associated with any of these transactions, but there were a vast number of transactions. And you say that it's no more um, complex than systems operated by, for example, banks. That is correct. Uh, you refer to an estimate that Legacy Horizon had over three and a half million lines of programming code. Uh, what, what's the general approach that a system designer ought to um, take to writing code in terms of its volume? It's all, less is always better, uh, certainly. Um, uh, however, uh, the, the requirements for different systems <coughs> require different volumes of, of software code, uh, but less is generally a better rule than more. And why is um, less better than more? Uh, uh, maintenance. Uh, well, uh, number one, simplicity of the coding uh, 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 aligns with a, uh, a, uh, a good structure of code. Uh, uh, but just as importantly, to the extent that maintenance needs to be done on the code, the less code that exists to begin with, the less code there is to maintain as updates uh, are made to the code. It's, it's just simpler. The, the, the smaller number of lines of code, the easier it is to maintain. Uh, is it possible to say whether this is a high number or a low number or an average number of lines of code, or can one not apply such descriptors to it? Uh, on the face of it, this looks like a, a very large amount of code. However... Um, I have not looked at the code. I, I don't know exactly what this code represents, so I don't have an opinion whether this is an appropriate amount of code or not. Just give us a comparison. The systems that you mentioned earlier that you designed for um, General Motors mm -hmm. and um, WorldCom, um, how many lines of code would we be talking about uh, there? I would say 20,000 lines or less of code. But as you said, that um, the number may be an indication that it was written as economically as could be, but is a reflection of the number of tasks that needed to be performed, or it's an indication that the code was not well written, but you, you haven't um, subjected the code to forensic analysis. That is correct. Because that wasn't within your instructions. That's right. You tell us that the documentation ran to more than 100,000 pages. What do you mean by the documentation? Uh, so there, uh, so documentation um, around the Horizon system, um, uh, there, there was a lot of it. So, so documentation could be user documentation, it could be updates to user documentation, it could be technical documentation, uh, updates, it could be business processes. Uh, all of those are encompassed in this, in this 
count. Um, this may sound a, a silly question, but is that um, a high number? Does it appear to be a high number? It, it appears to be a high number to me. Um, uh, I, uh, we need to take into account versioning, though. Uh, I'm, I'm positive that this probably encompasses, you know, version 1, version 1.1.1, version, you know, uh, of all of the different dimensions of, of documents. Uh, so it does appear to be a high number. Um, but I have not cataloged uh, or made a determination of whether it's excessive or not. You make the point that the system was created specifically for the purposes of servicing the post office branches and didn't have the added burden of integrating existing technologies. That's correct. W would that be a, um, a limitation on the um, possibility of additional complexity of a system? Uh, it would indicate that the complexity of the system was completely defined by this process and not uh, aggravated by any environmental factors of an existing system. In paragraph 4.5.5, um, you say that the project was ambitious in both scale and scope, and you draw some contrasts with the state of information technology um, at this time i.e. from about 96 to 2000. But you remind us um, that the, well, remind some of us, that the Nokia 3210 um, was the best-selling um, phone of 1999. Um, some of us would wish that that technology um, still existed. But it had a monochrome screen, is that right? Yes. Um, it didn't have any um, touchscreen navigation. We had to wait until 2007, I think, for that. Yes. And one couldn't access the internet through a browser on the phone. That is correct. You tell us that um, at this time, only about a third of people were estimated to have a personal computer. Yes. And only 30% of adults had um, access to the internet. Yes. And we had to wait until um, 2004 for all of the benefits of um, Facebook. <laughs> Facebook arrived in 2004. Uh, uh, at this time, the IT world um, was focused uh, on the so-called um, millennium bug. Yes. In terms uh, of IT development, you tell us again here that the prevailing method was the waterfall method and agile development wasn't um, mainstream in IT development at this time. That is correct. Can we turn with that background to the um, seven elements or aspects of the development and um, implementation of the Horizon system, which um, drove its um, complexity? Um, they're set out in your paragraph 4.5.6, which is at the foot of um, page 28 and on to 29, and there are seven elements set out in little a to g. Um, can um, you um, talk us through those? Firstly, the need to design a system that connected all post office branches to a central server, but could also withstand a loss of connectivity. Yes, so this was, a, this was a, you know, at that time, uh, this was a much more difficult problem than it is now, uh, simply because our communications infrastructure is much better now. It's much more robust. Um, uh, the reliability of connectivity, uh, uh, including the expense related to that connectivity uh, at this point in time, uh, uh, really provided issues uh, to anyone trying to uh, maintain what I would refer to as a, a client server type process, meaning you have satellite systems, which were the clients, and you would have the central system, which was a server. It's the, that, that, that this is just more a talking term. It's, it's, uh, I'm not positive I would describe the Horizon system as a client server, but, but it, it's, it's a good set of words to use in, in describing it. Um, the, uh, the fact that they had to contemplate, uh, they being um, uh, ICL Pathway, had to contemplate uh, an extended loss of connectivity meant that they 
uh, had to put in guardrails and safety nets uh, for those circumstances where the um, uh, where the where they knew the connectivity wouldn't exist, and they so they needed to not only create a design that allowed for a system that is connected to work, but they also needed to design, they needed to anticipate the fact that it could not be connected. So, so that was, those were two different logistical issues that they had to incorporate in their design and development of the system. And the point you're making here is that um, the system needed to be designed so that it could um, maintain its functionality or most of its functionality whilst there was a loss of connectivity, i.e. customers could still be served in the branch. That's right, because it, uh, it, it is uh, the customer uh, at each one of the branches uh, did not want a connectivity issue, uh, I'm sure didn't want a connectivity issue to stop them from purchasing stamps, for instance. Um, uh, so, so that uh, that required the um, the need for the design to anticipate connectivity issues, uh, and then um, allow for um, correct synchronization once connectivity had been restored. Right. So, so that's you know that that's that complicates the design and development of the system. Uh, so, when you're anticipating. Uh, a loss of connectivity, you have to have plan B. Okay, what, what, what does the system do now that I know I'm not connected? Now I need to keep a persistent store of the, you know, I need to number one, identify that I'm, I'm not connected. And number two, then I need to collect information until I know I'm connected again. And then number three, when I am connected again, I need to make sure that the information that's been stored up gets transmitted correctly to the central servers. So those are, uh, that might sound simple. That is, that is not a simple process necessarily. Um, the um, second area of complexity that you mentioned is the need to integrate a variety of software. And you mentioned in particular um, Riposte and Tivoli. Can you explain what Riposte and Tivoli were? Uh, certainly. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, in the design uh, of a system, you decide whether to buy or make uh, you know, certain functions within your system. Uh, in these instances, this is a buy. I want to buy. So, the repost was uh, uh, a software that basically allowed for the look and feel of the counter um, to be pre-made, uh, you know, the touch screens and, and all that, that, that was a product that was already- the, the user interface? The user interface, yes, yes. So, so Repost <laughs> provided that. Uh, it also provided the mechanism for capturing and transmitting the transactions that were related to all the activity that happened on the user interface through the counter. Uh, Tivoli, uh, was more of a behind-the-scenes type um, product. It was more of an operational type product, but it allowed it, it, it assisted the system to update uh, software packages and update reference data, which we'll talk about further uh, it, further on uh, in, in my report. But it was more of an operational um, uh, assistant uh, to help the horizon system work properly. You also say that there was a need to um, integrate a variety of hardware, including touch screens, printers, communications equipment, barcode scanners, weighing scales, um, pin pads, and the like. Yes. There, there was a, a, a particular setup that, uh, that was in the design spec, and, and those are the hardware components that were aligned with that setup. The third area of complexity that you mentioned is the need to accommodate hardware failures because hardware components in the 1990s were not as reliable as um, they are today. That is correct. The fourth element you mentioned is a large and div uh, diverse user base um, amongst sub-postmasters and the staff that they employed, um, which would have included varying levels of comfort using modern IT systems, um, in inverted commas, is that right? That is correct. And so you've got a cohort of people <coughs> that are more or less familiar and more or less happy 
with information technology at the point of rollout. Yes. Uh, you um, kindly note that Fujitsu itself noted that training was provided to 63,000 staff from the ages of 16 to 87 years of age with various skills involved. And you say that would, you believe, have presented a significant training rollout and support challenge? Yes. Uh, the fifth um, area of complexity you mentioned, I think, is the volume of the rollout. And you say that between August 99 and December 2000, over 14,000 branches had uh, Legacy Horizon installed. Yes. And you subsequently, um, in your report, set out in uh, the table at 4.2, no need to turn it up, um, the progression of that rollout month by month between August 99 and December 2000. Yes. The sixth area of complexity that you mentioned um, are, was the physical challenges of installing bulky IT hardware into branches. C can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yes, so the, um, there was a, a hardware specification uh, that went along with the Horizon system, which included the counter, printers, um, uh, tape rollers, uh, uh, card readers, and, and whatnot. Uh, uh, the, the branches might not have had space for those, uh, and that uh, uh, that presented logistical issues uh, for, I mean, just a physical logistical issue to, to implement the Horizon system at a branch. If they didn't have space, they, they, they had that issue. Uh, additionally, there were communications uh, 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 constraints at some of the branches. Some of them uh, uh, didn't have access to some of the uh, communication systems that were, that the Horizon system was designed for. So some of them didn't have an ISDN line, is that right? That's correct. And so they had to use a satellite link? Yes. Uh, and lastly, seventhly, you mentioned the um, a complexity that was added because of the need for the system to be very secure, because after all, it dealt with transfers of money as well as containing um, personal information. That is correct. And you say overall that those challenges, in your view, uh, made the design, build, and rollout of Legacy Horizon very ambitious. Yes. Uh, can we turn then to the um, high level design of the Horizon system? This is over the page at paragraph 4.5.8. And so bearing uh, those points of complexity in mind, can you explain to us the elements of the um, high-level design of the Horizon system, starting with the fact that it was a system that used data-driven logic rather than dealing with prices um, in its source code? Is, is that right? That is correct. Can you um, explain um, this concept um, to um, me, um, the public, and the chair, using the example that you give of um, hammers, screwdrivers, and pliers costing five, seven, and six pounds, uh, respectively, uh, that you have included in your report, please. A absolutely. Uh, uh, this is a very simple example, um, uh, certainly, um, but uh, hopefully the concept will resonate as you think about the more complex features uh, of the Horizon system. Um, but what I'm trying to juxtapose is uh, to the extent that, that we wanted to process uh, a transaction for uh, hammer, screwdriver, and pliers, uh, through two, two different paths, one path being a source code path and one path being a, uh, a source code supported by reference data path. Uh, in 4.5.12, um, what I'm attempting to do is to show what source code might look like if it was the only arbiter of processing this data. Uh, there would have to be 
Um, so if you can walk us through the example that's in bold and... Um, sure, certainly. So, uh, so I'll just go line by line, and if you have questions, then, then you, can, you can ask them. So, you. so the purpose of both of these sets of code is to calculate uh, a basket total for the purchase of three items. Uh, so the first, uh, the first thing, the first uh, function that needs to happen is we need to set our total basket to zero. We need to start at zero. Uh, and then we are going to check if the product that's being, if one of the product that's being purchased is a hammer. If that is correct, then I'm going to multiply the quantity of hammers by five pounds and add this to the total basket amount. And you'll notice that this is what's referred to as hard coding. Uh, so this is hard coded software. So, so, so the, no matter how many hammers come through here, they're always gonna be multiplied by five pounds if this source code remains the same. The next item I'm looking for is a screwdriver. And if there are screwdrivers, I'm going to take the quantity of screwdrivers and multiply them by seven pounds and add that to the total basket amount. And then finally, we're going to look to see if the product is a pair of pliers. If we do have a product of, uh, being purchased as a pair of pliers, we're gonna multiply the quantity of pliers by six pounds and add that to the basket. And that will uh, generate uh, the, uh, the total basket amount uh, based off of this hard-coded. Uh, you'll, you'll notice at the bottom I also uh, uh, check to see if there are any products that are not hard, you know, uh, hammer, screwdriver, or pliers. Uh, that's just a, a, a general error check uh, that, that is commonly used in, in, in code. But the purpose of this is just to multiply the number of, of, uh, of hammers, pliers, or screwdrivers by their respective costs or, or purchase amounts. And um, you've written this out in, I think, pseudocode not the actual code that would have been used. Is pseudocode a, a plain language um, description of the steps that might be taken in an algorithm or yes. a, another type of system? This, this, is, this is supposed to be a plain language representation of the logic that would be then implemented in a particular language uh, uh, that you're using, but, but it is not language specific. It's just, it's, it's supposed to represent the logic. And so this is intended for sort of human reading rather than machine reading. Exactly. Now this um, code enables the sale price of any of the three items to be changed. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, we could always go in and change the, the pound amount that's associated with each one of these items. But that would require a change to the source code. Yes. That is not ideal. Can we um, compare this to a data-driven logic approach and look at the code that is um, written in pseudocode um, <coughs> under paragraph 4.5.15? So again, the uh, part in bold and italics under 4.5.15. If we right. could just blow, I, blow that up. I, I do want to uh, uh, reference table 4.3, uh, which is behind it, uh, which uh, the, first, the first part of this uh, relies on the reference data that's in table 4.3. So okay, yeah, so that's it. We can see both of those, I hope, yes. at the same time. So yes. if you can talk us through this code by reference to the table at um, 4.3. Sure, sure. So as, as before, setting the total basket amount to zero. And then I'm iterating through uh, the different items that are purchased. So for every product purchase, I'm going to first look in that table, in the table 4.3, to see if I find that particular item. So for instance, if I'm looking for a hammer, I see that there, there's a hammer in that table, and I can see that the price for that hammer is five pounds. So if I find that product, I'm going to multiply the quantity by the, by the price and add it to the basket. In a similar fashion, when I get to the screwdrivers, I'm gonna take the quantity of screwdrivers and multiply it by the seven pounds that's associated with the screwdrivers. 
and then do the same thing for the pair of pliers. I'm going to multiply that by the six pounds uh, for the pliers by, by the quantity that was, that was purchased. Each time I do that, I'm adding it to the total basket amount, and at the end of it, I should have come up with the same total that the prior version uh, came up with. But the difference here is that any price changes can be made by an alteration to the product master table with no need to, to fiddle with the code. That's exactly right. Is there anything else you want to say? I mean, you say in your report here that since price changes can be frequent, um, it is appropriate to use the latter method rather than the former. Yes, so, so data-driven logic um, uh, or data-assisted uh, uh, programming uh, allows for uh, adroitness in maintaining the code or, or maintaining the system because you are not required, whenever you make a change to source code and try to deploy that, you should be going through the testing process to do that. To the extent that you can remove items like price changes from, from the code to more of a data-driven technology, that reduces the amount of items that need to be tested because you already know that the code works. You simply need to make sure that you are maintaining that table correctly without requiring going through the whole testing cycle for any new code. So, in the first example, if we changed prices, I would have to go change the code, and then I, in theory, should have to test that code again to make sure it works right. In the second example, I simply need to make sure that someone is in charge of maintaining this table correctly. I'm never changing the code, therefore I don't have to go through the, the testing process just because there's a price change. So in the first example, you said that you would, in theory, have to go and retest. Is that because the alteration to the code may have unintended consequences for other parts of the operation of the system? Yes. Now, in this simple example, this is such a simple example that I couldn't imagine what this change could do. But there are many uh, more complex issues that can be handled by data-driven logic. And those certainly have the opportunity to introduce more, uh, more issues uh, or, or, or more opportunities for error and, and would require a full battery of testing every time the code changed. You um, explained to us the high-level design of Horizon, um, the Horizon system. Can we turn to the high-level structure of the Horizon system? And you explained that there are a number of ways in which you might approach the um, description of um, a system like this, but you have, for uh, simplicity, characterized the system into um, four main components. And do we um, uh, see those um, uh, listed in 4.5.17? Yes. Can we um, go over the page, please, to figure 4.4 and um, just blow up that figure so it takes up the page? And using that figure, which sets out the component elements of uh, Legacy Horizon, um, deal with the four components in summary form first and then go into depth on three of the four components. So starting from the bottom of the table, please, uh, component A. Uh, is um, component A, or does component A, consist of the counter and the, the counter peripherals? So the parts of the system that were located in the branch consisting of both hardware and software? Yes. And then moving up to component B on the left-hand side of um, the table, is that the communications network? Yes. Um, this is, in summary, 
functionally the same as what we're used to nowadays, an internet connection, but in fact back then was either the dedicated ISDN line that we spoke about or um, sometimes uh, a satellite link. That is correct. Uh, can you just explain uh, what an ISDN line was? It, it, it effectively was a uh, it, it was a communication mechanism, uh, uh, a piece of hardware that uh, uh, was offered by telecom companies that allowed uh, a connection um, uh, to be made uh, to push data through from satellite offices to a central office. It, 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 was, it was a communication mechanism. And by satellite offices, you don't mean um, offices with a dish. No, no, sorry. Uh, you you uh, mean branches. remote, remote branches. Yes. yes, branches. Thank you. Um, this element, um, component B, is not something that we're going to explore um, further, other than to say that you understand that the communications network was provided by a combination of services uh, given by BT and a company called Energis. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, moving to component C on the right-hand side of the table here, uh, the messaging system. Did this comprise, again, in, in summary form for the moment, the software and protocols responsible um, for encapsulating data and for permitting communication between branches and the horizon campuses, as you call them? Yes. And then lastly, D, the campuses, the Horizon campuses. Can you explain in general terms, in summary level at the moment, uh, what the campuses are and why they're called campuses? Uh, uh, it's, they're called campuses because there were two of them, uh, one at Boodle and one at Wigan. Um, they were data centers um, operated by, um, uh, uh, by ICL, and they acted as the collector and manager of all of the transactions that were um, generated at the branches. Before um, looking at components A, C, and D in a little more detail, um, you make the point in paragraph 4.5.19 that the system was designed to operate um, with an available network con connection, i.e. in an online mode, but was also designed to operate without such a connection, um, an offline mode. This is something you mentioned uh, 15 minutes or so ago. Um, were there exceptions to that which prohibited the system from uh, operating um, other than in online mode? The... Um most services were able, or most transactions were able to be conducted in both the online and the offline mode, uh, with the exception of two. Um, uh, the national banking services. Um, the, uh, the network banking services. Sorry, net network banking services and the debit card services. The reason these two services were not allowed to operate in the offline mode is there had to be uh, a handshake confirmation that the transactions related that a confirmation that these transactions were allowed by the actual clients before that they before they could be transacted. So, in other words, if I was trying to withdraw money from a bank, the bank needed to tell uh, the Horizon counter that they gave permission to to withdraw that money. To the extent that the counter was in an offline mode, they could not communicate with the bank. Therefore, that service was not available. Thank you. Can we turn then um, to the first element of Legacy Horizon, component A? And uh, can you please run through the main physical components of um, the IT, IT system within component A located within the branch? This is 4521 of your report, please. Uh, certainly. Uh, uh, first, there was the counter. Um, this was the, the PC uh, that was had the, the touch screen on it uh, that uh, the, uh, the SPMs and, and, uh, and their employees would have operated the, the Horizon system through. 
Um, uh, so, so that encompasses both the A and B uh, subparagraph uh, on this section. Uh, they had a keyboard, a barcode reader, weigh scales uh, for weighing postal items, um, a, a tally roll printer, um, pin pads, and an A4 printer. Um, just looking at the, those in um, some more detail, the keyboard, um, you described this as a specialized financial keyboard with a magnetic strip reader and smart card reader on it. So this was a bespoke design? Yes, that is correct. And the tally roll printer, what, what is meant by tally roll? Um, it, was, um, it was the printer used for printing out uh, customer receipts as well as some of the reports that were designed by the Horizon system. <laughs> you say that um, some branches had um, but a single counter and by a, a counter, do you mean the elements that you've just described? Yes. Um, and that was about 46% um, uh, of all branches had a single counter. And I think you tell us that the figures you've seen suggest that 33% of branches had two counters and the remainder three or more counters. Is that right? That is correct. Um, is it right that in order to use a counter, an SPM, a subpostmaster, would need to log into the counter using their assigned username and password? Yes. Can we look, please, at the figure on um, page 35, 4.5, and just um, uh, blow up the... Um, figure at the top of the page there. Thank you. Um, is this right, your um, depiction of a setup in branch where there existed a single counter? Yes. And um, can you just um, talk us through it, please? Certainly. Um, so, so you'll see the components that, that we already described. You have the counter, the pin pad, the weigh scales, the monitor, the keyboard, the tally roll, and the barcode reader, and, and the A4 printer. Um, all of those are connected to the PC, or what we're going to refer to as the counter specifically. Uh, and the counter, uh, it, you'll also notice that uh, uh, the counter, it's called the gateway PC, and this will make more sense when we get to the multi-counter uh, description. Um, but every branch had a gateway PC. Uh, to the extent that the branch had a single counter, that single counter was the gateway PC. Um, that gateway, the, the purpose of the gateway PC designation is that is what communicated with the campuses. Uh, and you'll notice that you see the, uh, the two direction arrow uh, that connects the gateway PC and the LHITS campus. Um, some of the components were used by the customer, some components were used by the SPMs, and uh, the weigh scales could be used by either. Can we turn to the position on multi-counter branches, please? Um, can we look over the page, please, um, at table or figure 4.7 and blow that up, please? Um, is this your depiction of the position in multi-counter branches? It is, yes. And again, can you talk us through it, please? Uh, certainly. So, so the, the, the big distinction between the single-counter branch and the multi-counter branch is the fact that there are multiple counters at the multi-counter branch. But the difficulty or, or the complexity that this presents uh, for this particular branch is that there's still only one of the counters acting as the gateway between the um, LHITS campuses and the branch. All of the other counters that are not considered the gateway PC have to be uh, connected to the gateway PC. And you can see that there is uh, an extra box in this diagram uh, that is labeled hub connecting the counters. And that is the mechanism, that is the the extra piece of uh, technology that needed to be introduced to connect, make sure that all the all the counters uh, could communicate with each other, and importantly, communicate with the gateway PC, because the gateway PC counter was the communication hub 
to the El Hits campus, uh, which is important because that's what transmitted all the transactions. There was um, a function or a feature of um, this system, I think, that allowed a sub postmaster to transfer um, an open session when dealing with transactions um, between counters. Is that right? That is correct. And can you just explain um, what that feature was? Uh, so the, uh, the so this goes back to anticipating you know problems um, uh, or operational situations where perhaps a, an SPM or one of their clerks had started a transaction with a customer at a particular counter and for whatever reason needed to switch to a different counter. Uh, the, the functionality that, that you just described is uh, part of the design of the Horizon system in that you could move <coughs> that particular session from counter A to counter B if you found that necessary. Thank you. Can we turn to the software, please? That, that uh, table can be taken down. And I think it's right that Horizon used the Windows NT operating system. NT meaning um, new technology, is that right? That is correct. Uh, which, of course, it was at the time. Um, you explained that users were prevented um, from uh, directly accessing Windows. Um, is that right? That is correct. And what's the importance of um, that um, preventative step? Uh, the, uh, all of the functionality uh, that uh, the SPMs uh, at the branch, at SPMs and the clerks at the branches, all of the functionality uh, that they needed was through the Horizon software. Uh, there was no need for them to ever get to the operating system level, which is what Windows NT was. Uh, the setup configured each one of the counters uh, so that as it booted, the Horizon system came up, or the repost, uh, the, the, the screens, the, the, the user interface, the touch screens would come up, and there would be no ability for the user to get to Windows. Why is that important? Um, if all of the functionality that the SPMs needed to operate the Horizon system existed within the Horizon application, there's no need to do, go anywhere else because only bad things could happen at, at that point. You, if you had access to the operating system, you could change configurations. You could, you could do a lot of things that, that would um, deteriorate the PC and perhaps make the Horizon system not work correctly. So I, I suspect that that is why no access to the operating system was, uh, was part of the design. So the system was configured to prevent sub-postmasters having access to a dot prompt? Y yes. Or, 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 or yes. Yes. Is that what you cabled you, a little you bit? You could say the dot prompt, yes. It, it would restrict their access to the dot prompt. Thank you. The um, Windows NT operating system, how old was that at the time in, in, in 2000? Can you it, recall? It, 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 it was aging. Uh, by the time the 2000s came around. I believe it was introduced in the mid-90s. Um, uh, so it, it, was, it, was, it was mature. And um, do such operating systems have planned obsolescence within them? Yes, they do. And do you happen to know what the planned date of obsolescence was for Windows NT? Um, I believe that the uh, I believe that that was the mid 2000s that the planned obsolescence for Windows NT was. It, you tell us that rather than being um, allowed directly to access Windows, um, sub postmasters when they logged on were sent um, automatically um, to. Um, a piece of software that had been specifically con uh, configured uh, for the post office, the um, Ripost desktop. Is that right? Yes. And um, 
can you explain to us what the Ripos desktop was? Uh, the Ripos desktop was the user interface uh, uh, that the clerks uh, at the branches would have interacted with to operate the Horizon system. You say this was largely based, i.e. that system, the Ripos desktop, on a commercial product named Ripos from the Isha Group. Um, what do you know about the Isha Group? Who were they? Uh, uh, I know that they were a, um, uh, a software um, uh, development group that specialized in retail uh, software. They were a separate um, company from um, ICL um, Pathway Limited and Fujitsu Services Limited, is that right? That is correct. And uh, you go on to say that the counter user interface or UI user interface was designed to be a simple and intuitive, was designed to be as simple and intuitive as possible, and was specifically tailored for use in a retail environment. So the counter user interface, that's the same thing as the Ripoff's desktop? Yes. And um, it, you say that the intention was that the sub postmaster or clerk had no um, uh, requirement to type, is that right? That is correct. And so what was done instead of typing? Uh, there was a touch screen. They could, they could use the touch screen as well as uh, 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 the card readers and the pin pads to enter information into the Horizon system. And some transactions, is this right, were initiated not by touching the screen but by an activity on a peripheral? That's correct such as um, swiping a magnetic card or reading a barcode using the barcode reader? Yes. Uh, can we display um, over the page, please, um, figure 4.9? Sorry, 4.8. Um, can we blow up that at the top of the page, please? Is this a um, screenshot of um, uh, the user interface on uh, Legacy Horizon? Yes. Can we see that it's split into two parts, about two-thirds or four-fifths away across the page from left to right? We can see a, um, a line going up and down the screen. Is that the division between the left-hand and the right-hand part? Yes. And there were a series of menu buttons on the left-hand side. Uh, were those um, menu buttons or, or tiles available to press in the context of a particular transaction? Yes. And is it right that some of them sometimes displayed a stop sign prevent, uh, preventing them from being depressed and actioned because they weren't available for that particular transaction? Yes. And then on the right-hand side is what um, you describe as a stack showing the purchases made by the customer. Is that right? That is correct. Is there anything else you wanted to um, say about the um, user interface, the screen on Legacy Horizon? Um, the, you know, the intent um, and, uh, you know, whether this intent was fulfilled is, is to the taste of, of the user. Uh, the intent was to make it as simple as possible, make it a graphical interface, and, and to re reduce the, uh, uh, the chances for error. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, beyond that, no, I don't have anything else uh, uh, I want to say about this screen. Thank you. You speak in your report, that can come down, thank you, um, of the concept of a stock unit, and you describe it as being an important concept. Can you explain what a stock unit is and why it is important? Uh, certainly. So, um, so for the uh, managerial accounting uh, at each one of the branches, uh, uh, a stock unit was a concept or an abstraction of how to it gave the branches the ability to, um, uh, to organize themselves however they felt fit. 
um, the the stock unit there could have been one so we'll get to this and when we get to the rollover but but essentially a stock unit um, was could represent a particular till it could represent a particular till for a particular amount of time but essentially it was a way to account for your stock and your cash at that particular branch for a particular period of time and it allowed like I said it allowed the SPMs to um, to divide up their uh, stock and cash amongst their different clerks as well as to um, uh, limit the amount of time, you know, uh, uh, cordon, it, cordon down the, the time uh, uh, that, that that stock and cash was in the possession of someone. It, uh, it, I fear I'm, I'm not being clear here. It, it, it's an abstract concept that basically allows you to divide up the cash and stock uh, within a particular branch as, you, as the SPM felt fit, either across people or across time dimension. Thank you. You say in your report it's a way of managing cash and stock. Um, they can be allocated to an individual sub-postmaster on a medium-term basis or to an individual counter-clerk. And then that person is responsible for ensuring that the stock unit balances at the end of the period, whether that be a week or however long the stock unit is allocated to them for. Yes. You say um, stock units are assigned identifiers such as DD or AA. C can you just explain, explain what you mean there? Uh, certainly. So, so if there are multiple stock units that are being issued by the SPM, um, uh, they need a unique identifier. Uh, and DD and AA are just examples of how you might uniquely identify a stock unit. You say that um, sub-postmasters can transfer stock between stock units using a function on the counter. Um, stock units can be individual or can be shared between multiple counter clerks. In some circumstances, the sub-postmaster may choose to allocate a stock unit to a certain specified stock, such as um, lottery scratch cards. Is that right? Yes. And to what extent was this left to the um, sub-postmaster to determine, i.e. Um, the <coughs> object of the um, uh, stock unit, lottery scratch cards, the duration of the stock unit, uh, week, two weeks, um, or the number of people involved, um, a specific counter clerk or a specific counter? This, the, the concept of the stock unit uh, theoretically provided a lot of flexibility uh, for the SPM to use at their discretion. Thank you. So it's a couple of minutes before one. I was about to move to the uh, topic of modes. Um, can we pick that up at two o'clock, please? Yes, of course. Thank so you. I'll see everyone at two o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.